James Wesley Patterson is the tallest Texas legend you've never heard about, and he was my uncle. This is his story. Jim Patterson was born on the 4th of July, 1847, to Reverend James Marvin Patterson and his wife Lucinda in southwest Tennessee. The Reverend would migrate his young family to northeast Texas when Jim was only three, around 1850. They would purchase land in Cass County and then relocate to Bright Star, Arkansas, right across the border about five miles away, where the Reverend would form a church and a mason lodge <clears throat> but they would soon be back to Cass County. Now in 1850, to get to Texas, he would have brought his family up to um, Little Rock, and they would have gotten on the Southwestern Trail to Trammell's Trace in Texas. The next big stop would be Epperson's Ferry, where approximately this house was located in Cass County. That crossed the Sul Sulphur River. Now, to go see a man about some land named Stephen F. Austin down in Nacogdoches, you had to cross Epperson's Ferry. So this is pretty much the origins of Cass County. Uh, interesting story about this home. It was started but never completed. There was no lumber in Piney Woods, Texas. It all had to be used for Confederate coffins. Jim was too young to fight in the Civil War, and standing at over seven foot tall by the time he was a teenager, he would have been an easy target, so it was probably a good thing. But sometime after the Civil War, and during the bloodiest years of Texas Reconstruction, he found a way out. He found his way to the Sells Brothers Circus, or the Sells Brothers Circus found him. Now, they have a really cool history. I'll include a few links below. They were the second largest operating circus in North America around the turn of the century, eventually bought out by Barnum and Bailey. I know Buffalo Bill and Annie Oakley uh, toured around the same time as he did with the Sells Floto Circus. Uh, maybe Tom Thumb also. I don't know. I'd like to find out. Jim was a tall man, but he was not an ugly man. He had a symmetrical face. He had pretty hands. He was a good-looking guy. He could easily pass as a woman, and often did, for the world's tallest. He traveled every U.S. major city, coast to coast, and in between, west coast to east coast. Um, eventually, he made a multi-continental tour where he was celebrated worldwide. He performed for royal families on almost every continent. But the highlight of his career came when he entertained Queen Victoria and King Edward VI. They supposedly danced and sang all night. Ooh, if I had pictures of that. Um, he'd often write home about how expensive the women's dresses cost in 1880, or in that time frame, um, or at least the dresses that he preferred. They cost up to $100, almost $3,000 in today's money. And allegedly, those dresses did not always come off in the evening. More on that later. According to articles, though, those who knew him said he just didn't care, right? He did not make others' principles his own. Rather, he reasoned out all sides and never cared about public opinion. I did not see any mention of a Sasquatch suit for a seven-foot guy, but we'll find out. <clears throat> Around 1895, Uncle Jim was slowing down. He was turning 50. He wanted to settle down a little bit, so him, my grandfather, George Washington Patterson, and their brother, Jeff, set up shop in Bloomberg. You can see a few pictures here. It's downtown around 1905. Here's the post office. I think Mr. Stuckey is the postmaster there. Now, the Pattersons were definitely influential in getting the Kansas City Southern Railroad through their little downtown. Here's the depot. Here's one of the engines. A map of the route, straight as the crow flies. It was right through Bloomberg to Kansas City and oh, through Oklahoma, which is important to my family's story, certainly. Jim and Jeff were the first merchants to open in town. Those were my uncles, Jim and Jeff Patterson. Um, and my grandfather, G.W., opened the cotton warehouse. He was one of the most, or he may have been one of the wealthiest cotton brokers in Texas by the time it was done. Here's the original deed for the land that was sold to him to build the cotton warehouse, sold for one dollar. Pretty good deal. I wonder if Jim had anything to do with that. Um, here's the depot again, and 
this train was called the Dummy, and it ran between Bloomberg and Atlanta, Texas, about 15 miles. It was called the Dummy because it didn't have any bells or whistles, so it couldn't warn people. Maybe it was smart. I don't know. Here's an article from the 1872 New Yorker. It looks like it's a map of the railroad system once you get into Texas for those entrepreneurs or whatever looking. By 1916, the family had done so well, they built the tallest building in Northeast Texas at the time. It cost $10,000 or $300,000 in today's money approximately and stood tall above the city, easily seen by the train passengers on the way into town. Now this bank stayed open for 100 years under the same ownership before, emer or, uh, before merging, merging uh, whatever, for merging in 2016. Um, 100 years, never went out of business, not through the Great Depression, it stayed. But uh, the bank was on the bottom floor, the communications offices were on the second floor, and that was for the railroad, telegraph, telephone, and where all the important business happened was the Mason Lodge on the third floor. Uncle Jim certainly acquired a lot of land. We'll go through that later. But what kind of man was he really? By this time in his life, he had experienced so much compared to virtually everyone else in the world. He'd seen the entire world and been treated as a celebrity. This was the golden age of the circus before movie stars. He was a star. When he came back to Bloomberg between circus tours, He'd be asked to pose with people on the street, give speeches, do appearances, sign autographs. He was a star. We know he died a lifelong bachelor, never married. He was generous with his family and friends. Now, there are stories of him buying exotic gifts for his family, especially the nieces and nephews, who he absolutely adored and who adored him. It was not unusual for him to bring home a doll or a toy from New York City or Chicago, or on special occasion or Christmas, bring all of his nieces an expensive musical instrument, or even give a fresh case of oysters to a brother on his birthday. Jim was an extremely generous guy, and he was always willing to help out friends and family. Oops, gotta go back. He invested in local businesses. He always wanted to help citizens down on their luck, but it was never a handout. See, Jim was a shrewd businessman. He always charged interest on his loans. He believed capable men should be able to provide for themselves without dependencies. His motto was, God helps those who help themselves and others. And being Big Jim Patterson certainly had its advantages when it came time to collect the bills, but he was always willing to work with people, accepting menial, menial repayments, such as syrup or a chicken, which he would almost always turn around and give to someone else who needed it more. He was a shrewd businessman for sure and made a few enemies along the way but he was always well respected and regarded as a man of high moral character. When he died on Halloween night, 1920, in Bloomberg's largest house in the middle of downtown, he made sure he took care of his family as always, especially the nieces and nephews. In his will, he gave, I can't tell exactly how much, but he gave money to nieces and nephews before even the debts were paid, which is unusual for a will. Um, his four brothers were given his, his large assets when he died since he didn't have any children. And my grandfather, G.W., was his executor, or the executor of that will. I'm sure he had several. Um, and when he died, it was worldwide news. These are obituaries printed from California to Massachusetts, all points in between. And there's a cool story behind his grave that I'll get into the next episode. But in Bloomberg, this was all that needed to be said. James Patterson, the big man from Bloomberg, was over Saturday. So, this has left me with three questions. It's been about four months of research. Um, but, yeah, three questions I really want to answer here. Number one, was Jim really 8 foot 4? So, his obituary, you know, in Texas he was 8 foot 4, right? But in his obituaries, it lists him as 5 or 7 6, 7 5. I mean, he was a giant guy. Oh, don't look for this Wikipedia entry. They removed that about five minutes after. I, d I don't know how Wikipedia works, but um, yeah, that didn't stay. Question two was, did Uncle Jim live an alternative lifestyle? And if he did, what did that look like in Northeast Texas in the 1800s, right? 
you could probably get away with it in San Francisco, New York, Chicago for a while, <clears throat> but Northeast Texas might be an interesting story. And finally, what's the Bigfoot connection, right? I mean, if you don't believe somebody's walking around in a suit, you believe in Bigfoot. Who had the means to do something like that? Let's find out. So please like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell if you enjoyed this content and want to stay updated. <clears throat> um, I'll be going to Northeast Texas actually tomorrow to do some more research on Uncle Jim, the rest of the family, and two other characters I want to get some information on. Um, but the first one is Cullen Montgomery Baker. Now, this guy was a real scumbag, but there were... There was a movie made about him. There, was, uh, there were several books written. The Louis L'Amour book glamorized him as a fast draw. Um, but I think I have a clip of the movie here. Uh, here, watch this real quick. It's called uh, Mula de Cullen Baker, which I think means he was either a jackass or had a lot of money. Here you go. ¿Acaso es el único hombre aquí? Le daré una recompensa al que lo agarre. ¿Cuánto está usted dispuesto a pagar? Lo que sea, pero tráiganlo. ¿No le importa el precio? No. Tráiganlo. Ok, I think that one won several awards, but um, the next thing I want to look at are look into is the Colin Baker Country Fair. It's been going on for 50 years. It started in the early 70s as a family reunion, from what I understand. So um, definitely want to check that out. Um, he was actually killed in Bloomberg, but buried in Oakwood Cemetery, Jefferson, Texas, which is where I'm staying tomorrow night. Not sure how he got down there, but we'll find out some info on that story maybe. Um, but the really cool story around Jefferson is around Diamond Bessie. Um, and I'm staying in the Excelsior House Hotel, which is supposedly one of the more haunted hotels in Haunted Jefferson. I'm staying in the Diamond Bessie room. I don't know if she ever stayed there or not. I know there's some pictures of her and stuff. Um, <clears throat> we'll find something out. But her story is super cool. She was murdered. Well, cool if you consider tragic cool. She was murdered by a rich um, Rothschild of the banking diamond Rothschilds, I guess. Um, so stay tuned for maybe an episode on her. And then the big one, the one we all want to know about, Mr. G.W. George Washington Patterson. Um, it looks like he left behind quite a bit of generational wealth, and I've gone down the rabbit hole on a lot of that. It could get interesting. Stay tuned. Hopefully, yeah, I, when I go over GW, I'll go over some of the tools I use to find what I found, which is some pretty good stuff. It might be informational or good information. Um, he had a bunch of land. <laughs> uh, anyway, hopefully that will lead me to my grandfather, my grandmother's father, who we know nothing about, no pictures, don't know where he died. Um, this may be him in a school picture. But Mr. Chester Hobson Patterson, born Hobson Chester Patterson, I know he grew up around the, the bank building. He was a telegraph operator for the railroad, but don't know a lot more about him past that. Maybe we'll find something out this week. Last thing, I wanted to thank the Cass County Genealogical Society. This is the library I'm going to tomorrow um, or Thursday. They provided me with the descendants of William Patterson, born 1750 in Virginia. Uh, it's been amazingly helpful, and if you guys are doing any sort of genealogical research, you've got to reach out to your local um, society. And if you live in Cass County, you're lucky, because it, they have so much stuff. Um, and I think that's it. Oh, wait, wait, I need to pay, I need to pay a few bills here. Okay, here we go. Want to get out of Texas this summer? Maybe for some squatch watching of your own. Bear Cliff Cabin. 
Located in the heart of Bigfoot country, beautiful Cherry Log, Georgia, Superhost Brendan brings you this gorgeous, secluded, and spacious retreat, perfect for watching squatches. And if you're into bears, too. Within only a few miles of the historic Expedition Sasquatch Museum, this scenic porch overlooks dozens of big, beautiful trees, bears, and probably Bigfoots. Here's a guest submitted photo of one of Brandon's guests. I'm sure he left good feedback. And coming soon for 2021, Sasquatch Ridge Cabin. And my notes say here, if you reserve this cabin, you do not at least see a Bigfoot or encounter a Bigfoot. He'll give you a 50% refund on your reservation now through September. And it also says here, they and the bears are really attracted to pets and small children. So bring the whole family. Roll away beds available upon request. Make your reservations today. All right, that's it. Thanks again for watching. Please like, subscribe, click the notification bell. And if you're looking forward to the next one, bye for now.